Yeah, and thanks very much for getting me over too, because it is a hell of a long way to come. <laughs> from yeah. Australia. yeah, Jim. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll be off and running in just a moment, guys. Who's come the furthest? Anyone come from Australia? Yeah, one person. One person. Oh, and me. Oh, we'll have a beer later, mate. We'll have a chat about it. <laughs> ah, let's see if we can make all this work. Almost done. There we go. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for having me here to do the OWASP keynote. Now, I thought a lot about what to do for a keynote because keynotes are meant to be sort of really insightful, right? Like really reflective and, you know, looking at the industry and very uh, interesting things to take away with you. And the more I thought about what we should do for an opening keynote, the more I realised that in AppSec it's just, like, it's crazy. There is so much stuff going on. And every time I thought of something, I'd go, yeah, but there's something else and there's something else. And I'd see all this really crazy stuff. And I thought, well, what I should do is actually turn this into a keynote of just crazy stuff, about 50 different crazy things that do tell a bit of a story about what's going on in the industry. So I thought I'll make it 50 shades of AppSec and I'll go through 50 different things over the next 45 minutes. And it does tell a bit of a story and where I wanted to start was around the democratisation of hacking. Now what do I mean by this? Because this is kind of an interesting thing. So what I mean is it's very easy for anybody to become a hacker. So anyone see this kid last year? Five-year-old kid hacked his dad's Xbox. We know he hacked it because the news headline says he hacked it. But what he did was he fat-fingered the controller and managed to circumvent the parental controls. So he did actually get a privilege escalation, which was pretty cool. Ended up getting his name up there on the Microsoft Security Researchers page. And you'd be pretty stoked as a dad, wouldn't you? It's like my five-year-old is now a security researcher. Kid got a bug bounty as well. So anybody can become a hacker. Look how excited he is. He loves it. <laughs> He's like a little bug bounty kid now. Anybody can become a hacker. Now, the interesting thing is, is that we've got a lot of tools out there that help people become hackers very, very easily. So things like Bishop, it's a browser plugin. So all you do is you just browse around the internet and it looks for vulnerabilities like misconfigured admin, open source control systems. It just does it for you. You browse the net and it says, here you go, there's this and there's this and there's this. And it does the hacking for you. So it's very easy to become a hacker. Now, if you do actually want to start using some intelligence, there are a lot of tutorials out there about how to become a hacker. It's very easy to find tutorials with Google Docs that look for query strings and URLs. And then you go to the URL and you put a single quote and you get an internal database exception. And then you go to the URL and you copy it and then you go and paste it into Habbage and you own all the things. It's easy. Anyone can become a hacker when there's tutorials like this. So we make it, rightly or wrongly, very accessible for anybody to become a hacker. <clears throat> now, not everybody wants to become a hacker. Sometimes they want to hire a hacker. <laughs> and it's made now very, very easy to simply hire a hacker. This is not the underground and the dark web of where you find criminal masterminds in the underworld. This is mainstream, consumer-facing, hackerlist.com. It's a nice responsive design website. It's got smiling stock photos. It's very easy to go and just hire a hacker to do your dirty work. So I'm not sure if, <laughs> if these guys are the hackers or the customers. Everybody looks so happy about the fact that you can start a project for free. It's that simple to become a hacker. Now, this has led to a few other interesting things as well. So one of the things clearly that's happened in recent years is this hacktivist movement. So we've had hacktivists emerge. Now, you may be like me and be wondering exactly what is a hacktivist, because I see the term a lot, and it seems to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I really like Swift on Security's take on it. And if you don't follow Swift on Security, start, because he or she or <laughs> whoever is kind of awesome. And I really like this definition. And it sort of speaks to the opportunism of hacking. Find some stuff, own it. We'll come up with a reason later on. There'll be something. These guys must have done something wrong. And often that is the case. So we see things like this. This was in Australia a few years ago. And it's 
op tripwire, op assange, op whatever the hell they want it to be for that day, this is a government website. Now, there must be something the government's doing wrong, right? Well, like, we'll find something they've done that we don't like and we'll make it up. And as it turns out, with this particular site, it wasn't so much a government website as it was an NGO to support people with disabilities. This is sort of a rehabilitation program. And frankly, I think she's been a bit kind on that. She's been a little bit subtle. But this is what often happens, right? This is just legitimate, honest business, but it's online, it's accessible, it's easy to own. Now, the problem as well is that when it becomes so easy, we see a lot of stuff like this. So we see a lot of kids. And I mean kids both in the sense of all of us are probably starting to feel a bit older and they're young, so they must be kids, but some of them are legally children as well. And they're in there following the tutorials to use Havage or Loic or whatever the thing of the day might be to go in and own stuff. And that's a real problem as well. <laughs> the interesting thing is every time they turn up at court, they're with their mums. That's how they get to court, because they're too young to even buy a freaking car. They're literally still children. And the problem is, is that they basically end up criminalising themselves very early, which is bad news. I mean, it used to be they would have been out there spray painting fences or doing something they should get a kick up the ass for but not go to jail for. And now, because of the accessibility of hacking, they end up in some serious trouble. Now, when they do get criminalised, we get into this world of, OK, now we've actually got a lot of criminal hacking going on. And one of the problems with criminal hacking is it is so safe. You know, you think about the other criminal pursuits, where I could break into a service station or a liquor store, I may get my head smashed in with a baseball bat, so there's that, but I could go home and sit at the PC, and if I've got my OPSEC half decent, I'll probably remain fairly anonymous. I may be in a part of the world where I'm beyond extradition anyway. Do you really want to export someone from the Ukraine for DDoSing? Probably not going to happen. So it's a safe business. Now the problem is, because it's such a safe business and it's so easy for anyone to get into, is we see a lot of this sort of stuff. And this is just the most random, pointless crap that pops up. So this is on Pastebin. Steal an arseload of data for the lulls. <laughs> and then if you want to get your data off the internet, because apparently you can get your data off the internet now, um, send BTC. So send us Bitcoin and we will take your things off the internet. Which is, of course, ridiculous because it doesn't work like that. It also goes to the other extreme. There's kind of the opposite implementation where they go, okay, look, here's a bunch of data. Because this is Dropbox. Everyone knows Dropbox was hacked, right? Because it's on Pastebin. So, so here's a segment of nearly 7 million Dropbox accounts. We're going to dump them all on Pastebin. And if you give me Bitcoin, I'll actually give you more accounts. So this is kind of the reverse. This is we will put more stuff on the internet if you give us money. Now, what often happens is when we see this sort of stuff, it is not, of course, Dropbox that's been hacked and Dropbox that's sitting up there on the net. And when you correlate these data against different breaches, so using something like my Have I Been Pwned system, I'll take an email address from the Dropbox hat. And would you know it, we've also got the Snapchat hack and the Facebook hack. And of course, all this stuff is just replicated data. So it's kids, I assume kids, going on the paste bin, copying, repasting, and then going, give me Bitcoin and I'll get your things off the internet. So criminal activity like this is very, very accessible. And you've got to wonder how successful it actually is. I mean, does anyone actually pay Bitcoin for this stuff? But there's a huge amount of it on there, about 50 different occurrences of this address over a couple of years against different pace. So that is nasty stuff. Now, the other thing we started seeing, particularly last year, was this, notice of extortion. You might have seen this one. Now, this was actually physical mail. It was sent out to legitimate businesses. And they were saying, effectively, look, if you don't give us one Bitcoin, we're going to damage your reputation. So we're going to phone in bomb threats, vandalism. We're going to damage your online reputation, which, of course, is extremely easy to do. And the worrying thing about it is they're saying, all it's going to take is one Bitcoin. Give us one Bitcoin and it all goes away. And one Bitcoin is sort of a level of money that you don't think too much about if it's the safety of your business. I mean, as much as there are assholes doing this, it's one Bitcoin. It's not too hard just to pay one Bitcoin and make the problem go away. But it's odd too, because clearly nothing has actually happened. It's a protection racket. It's just extortion. It reminds me of that, uh, that opening scene in Pulp Fiction where they're talking about the guy walks into the bank and he robs the bank with a phone because he says, I've got a little girl at the other end, we're going to kill her if you don't give us the money. Nothing's happened. It could be an empty threat. But this sort of thing happens and people do pay Bitcoin for it. Of course, that begs the question, so what are criminals 
doing with their bitcoins because there's a lot of them getting money. Well, it turns out a lot of them are buying Brazilian hookers. Now, when you actually go around owning routers and owning DNS and being able to control name resolution across some large number of routers, well, you can go and buy Brazilian hookers because you can start to stand up phishing pages just about anywhere. So it does become very easy to actually mount attacks, which, let's give them credit, are probably a little bit more sophisticated than the other ones we've seen so far. So this remains a problem. Obviously, there is a lot of criminal hacking going on, and none of us really want to see this degree of uh, malicious online activity. Now, one of the things that does happen with criminals online is, fortunately, they're not all that bright. A lot of them are not all that bright. And often they are coming undone in pretty spectacular style as well. So one that was very big news recently was this guy. So this was Ross Ulbricht. So you may know him as the Dread Pirate Roberts. You may also know him as the founder and mastermind of the Silk Road underground drug market. And uh, Ross was clearly having a little bit of trouble connecting through to his tall hidden service with Pearl. So he wanted to ask a question about his underground drug market and he put the question about how do I connect my underground drug market on Stack Overflow? And it was a fairly specific question, which was later part of the evidence that got him convicted. And he put it on there under an identity which was traceable back to him. He inevitably did other things wrong, and of course he did get arrested, and he's being convicted, and he's tens of millions of Bitcoin confiscated. But this is a simple thing. Just ask the question on Stack Overflow. Someone will know. So along similar lines, there's this guy. So he's been in the news a lot lately, Jihadi John. So he's the bloke who's gone around chopping people's heads off for reasons. And the interesting thing about Jihadi John is everyone's trying to figure out who he is because he's got this strong British accent. I mean, his accent doesn't quite match the profile of what you'd expect some jihadist in Syria to have. So they're trying to figure out who is this guy. And um, what ends up happening is that <laughs> it turns out that Jihadi John is into web design. So he wants to buy some web design software. So, I mean, here's the interesting thing. He's this terrorist chopping people's heads off. He doesn't torrent it. He goes online and he buys the web design software from his IP address in Syria using his British student ID. So not so bright. And that, in a way, sort of warms the cockles of your heart. Criminals are screwing up left, right, and center. They do end up getting caught. And often via frivolous reasons as well. And when it comes to criminals being caught via frivolous reasons or for crazy things, I'm particularly fond of this one. You guys might have seen this. This was a few years ago. So there was a guy going around owning Texas law enforcement websites. Now, I've not been to Texas, but I imagine that they don't have a lot of sense of humor around getting owned by activists. But anyway, so he's come up and he said, look, I've got this good idea. He's talking to his missus. He said, let's do this. I'll do this sign and then you lean over and take a photo with your iPhone and it'll be great. It'll piss them off and it'll rub it in and it'll, be, it'll all be a lot, of, a lot of laughs. So she's done this with the iPhone. And of course, what happens when you take a photo with the iPhone? You get metadata. XF data, you get Latin long down to about seven decimal places which get attached to the photo. And unfortunately for this bloke, he decided not to scrub the metadata from his photo before posting it, which did lead them directly to the lady here, which led them directly to him. So good news all round, really, for the, for the good side there. But what was really interesting with these guys as well is that it turned out to be this couple. And what strikes me with it is, is they look so normal, like they're just normal people. The shot before and obviously the attitude he had and the things he was doing were probably far from what we'd consider normal. But this is just a normal couple sitting in their living room somewhere owning <laughs> Texas law enforcement websites. And it sort of goes back to that point where anyone can become a hacker now. You can be a perfectly normal person in every other regard, but you're out there owning websites, which of course is pretty alarming. Now that also got me thinking. There are so many people who ultimately turn out to be a bit stupid in other ways that are successfully mounting these online attacks. So what is going on? And are we actually making it too easy on the criminals to be successful? And when you have a look at some of the things that we are building, and I say we collectively as builders, breakers, people involved in the software industry. Now, I like this one because when you think about it, it's quite ingenious. And a login is a high friction, bad usability sort of experience. You know, you've got to remember your credentials and you know, it's meant to be something that's long and strong. 
So what these guys do is I say, what we'll do is you take your mobile number and you put that in and your password is the last four digits of your mobile number because that way you can remember it. Now you can never give your mobile phone number to anybody else anymore. <laughs> However, this is a much nicer usability experience than trying to remember your password. Now we laugh at this, and this is a minor sort of obscure little website. But we also have things like this. And this was only from a couple of weeks ago. So this is Betfair, major online betting agency. Now Betfair were conscious that password resets are also a bit of an anti-usability pattern. They're a high friction process. You know, you've got to wait for the email and the reset and you know, all this kind of stuff that makes life hard. So they said, here's what we'll do. Right? What you do is you put in your username. And your username is your email address. You put in your birth date, and then you reset your password. That's it. Like, no email confirmation. All you have to do is show that you know an email address and a birth date. Now, you may think that that's silly, but there's a twist. There's a British journalist talking to Betfair on Twitter, and in fact, Betfair were basically berating him. It was a terrible, terrible Twitter exchange, which is now my blog. Uh, and what Betfair was saying is, yes, but your username is a secret. You should not be giving your username to anybody. It's your freaking email address. That's how people send me email. I give them the email address and then they send me email. And as for the birthday being a secret, well, I think we all know that birthdays are by no means a secret. But this was the implementation that they did and they thought that this would probably make life easier in some way. Now sometimes we go even further. And I particularly like implementations like this because there is an ingenious side to this. Hear me through. Yes, this is credentials in JavaScript, but there's no more postbacks to the server, no network latency, no server overhead, no hashing overhead on the CPU, on the server. This is, you know, in many ways, this actually works very well. Yes, the credentials are in the JavaScript, but it does work well. And you can almost kind of get someone going, well, it's in the source code. I want to look there. It'll be fine. <laughs> Don't worry about that. But this sort of thing happens, and it continues to happen. So when we look at how a stupid criminal is successful, well, sometimes we are making it rather easy. Now, we also do other things like this. So this is a sitemap. Now, a sitemap is meant to be a resource that describes all the other resources on the site. So you go to the sitemap, and it lists everything that's there. And users kind of are a thing on a site, right? So you would put users in the sitemap, and Credentials kind of are an attribute of the entities which you do put in the sitemap, so maybe it all makes sense in a, in a strange kind of way. But this was literally a sitemap with all the users and all the credentials in it. So again, it, it, it does kind of make you wonder. You, you don't necessarily have to be a super smart criminal in order to be successful. Now having said that, some of these examples are a little bit frivolous. You know, this is nuts, and I'm sure that you're probably like me and have probably never seen this before and may never see it again. But stuff that we do continue to see is stuff like this, and everybody will see what this is within about two seconds in this room. I suspect this audience knows exactly what it is. But SQL injection, and it's number one in the top 10 in 2013, and it's number one in 2010, and it still continues to be everywhere. And people say, how is this still a thing? How do we still do this? Because wasn't this a remnant of our older programming languages and our older practices and all the things that we've now learned we shouldn't do and we don't do this anymore. Except this is from this year. This is from a blog post from a few months ago. And this guy has written an article on how to do a password reset. Now eventually your password does get reset. There may be, <laughs> may be some other things that get reset as well. This example also included how you connect to the database under the SA account, which is effectively God writes on SQL Server. So we're writing this stuff now. And again, I say we collectively because it is our industry. So SQL injection continues to be a thing. And I guess the concern is it's probably still going to be a thing in the next top 10 and for some time after that because we're still writing this stuff. And the worst thing is as well, you see these posts and then you read the comments. Thank you. This has been very helpful. I've now gone and done this in my system. Because people do go and copy and paste the text and they build their systems in this way. You know, what really blows me away with this is you just literally fall into the pit of success with modern web frameworks these days. It is so hard to actually do things badly compared to how easy it is to do things well. Yet we still keep doing this. Now sometimes I'm also wondering in terms of our users, are we making it too easy for our users? So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. 
Are we making it too easy for them to implement poor security? Now, the first thing that gets me with this, this is Lego, is why do they need your birth date? Do we really need to keep perpetuating sensitive classes of data? Because if you had the birth date, you'd go and log into Betfair. You know, you don't really want to be leaking this stuff in places you don't have to. But for some reason, they want the birth date, so fair enough. But the thing that really struck me is the advice around the password. Now, if we get past the big and the little letters, or the big and the small letters, and all right, maybe it's a kid thing, and kids understand that better. But keep it short so it is easy to remember. It's a bit hard to argue with the fact that, yes, it would be easy to remember. <laughs> I can't debate that. But it's such conflicting advice to everything else that we try and tell consumers. And somewhere, someone building the web app put this in there. They were probably told to, it would make sense, but they let that get through. They didn't push back. And we end up with Lego saying the right thing to do, and it's almost even worse that it's probably kids, because get them while they're young, keep your passwords short. This is really not the way we want to kick off. So stuff like this is happening. Now that's very sort of vague, high-level kind of advice. Look, just keep it short, it'll be right. And other times we get really oddly specific about what we do and don't like with passwords. Now Virgin doesn't like wankers. Branson seems to be very happy about this. Now, for some reason, Virgin had a whole list of different words which they wouldn't allow on the password. Now, this wasn't sort of, we have a minimum entropy and you've got to have this many lowercase and symbols and all the other stuff that goes into passwords. This was, we specifically don't like wankers. And inevitably, it makes you wonder why they don't. And I don't mean wankers in terms of the, you know, the individual. Don't worry about that. But in terms of the actual word, so what was it about having that word that they didn't like? Because inevitably, if they're worried about offending someone, I'm not going to offend myself if I want to use that as my password. So who else is looking at it? Because that, like, it's not like the CPU gets upset, right? There's an operator somewhere who is looking at the passwords. So again, really bad sort of odd advice. And the other thing that we tend to see a lot when we talk about bad, odd security advice is we do struggle a lot with security questions. Now, of course, security questions are meant to be things that only you know that shouldn't be easily discoverable. <laughs> things like where you went to school, probably not such a good idea. Uh, things like what's the capital of California, probably not such a good idea. That is a good... <laughs> we should make that a question. <laughs> uh, so that sort of thing is, is oddly specific. And it really, it's a pub trivia question. It's not a security question. But we see that. And I think we struggle a lot with security questions because on the one hand, we ask very odd questions like this, which anyone should know. And then on the other hand, we go and ask questions like this, which nobody has any idea about whatsoever. <laughs> That's probably not the name of his grandmother's dog either. <laughs> But we do these things with our security questions. And it is a hard thing to find the right balance, find something that's not too easily discoverable, but that you can remember and that's unique and all the rest of it. And it got me wondering if maybe this comes down to the way we're educating developers. So are we actually not giving developers the right message? So is there guidance out there that's making it hard for them to do the right thing? So I looked around, I thought I'll find a little bit of advice online that teaches people about application security. And I found this one. Hey, what's up YouTube? This is NextGenHacker101 and today I'll be teaching you guys how to view other computers' IP addresses. Alright, what you do is, is you type in Tracer T and then space. Alright, now this is a cool thing. Tracer T and then space. Now what you want to do is you want to type the site uh, you want to view. So you want to go HTTP, semicolon, slash slash, and then, uh, well not semicolon, the little dot dot, and then the website. So like let's just say Google. Oops. So like let's just say we want to see how many IPs are looking at Google right now. And like at this exact moment we're going to find how many people are looking at Google, what their IPs are and what their connection speed is. Here we go. Once you've done tracer T space and then the website http dot dot slash slash and the website I'm doing Google if you want to go ahead and do that as an example and then you enter it and here we go. Here they come. One, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, 
seven, eight, nine, ten. And hold it. Hold it. All right. Ten people are currently using uh, Google and looking at it. Uh, look, it's a good thing that kids get involved, right? And it's. I just hope no one's then going out and, <laughs> and using that. But it, you know, this is the funny thing. We do get very odd advice, and it's, it's one thing seeing kids create videos. And again, good on him for actually getting out there and having a go. This thing has got so many views, you wouldn't believe it as well on YouTube. <laughs> many, many, many millions. But then we get other advice online for developers. Advice around things like, let's set an exercise, and you guys are going to need to encrypt a credit card. Now, the way I want you to do this is I want you to use your Base64 and encrypt it. Because it looks encrypted at the other end. I don't know what it means. <laughs> you look at the output. Do it twice, it's more secure. Do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a real worry because this is the information that we're giving developers a lot of the time. That's the info, well, it's not us, so don't let me rope you all into it, but that is the information that they're getting online. And encryption is hard. I mean, I think probably those of us that do work in AppSec realize how much we probably don't know about encryption. And then when you start to look at other advice online, you realize how much other people don't know about encryption as well. So this was a Stack Overflow question. How do I securely store my passwords in the database? Now, this guy has come up with an ingenious plan. Because what he said is for each character of the password, you get the ASCII value and you add five. And then, then guess how you decrypt it? <laughs> Take away five. Easy, easy, easy. And you don't have to worry about keys or any of that kind of rubbish that just gets in the way. There are two other responses as well to this particular question. One of them was, again, base 64, and the other one was, instead of five, use 13. So it's like twice as strong. <laughs> and it works, because you look at the output and it just doesn't look like anything decipherable. Now, we do learn a lot about the way people build systems by looking at the questions they ask online. And sometimes we are rather appalled. It's concerning because this is telling us the way people are building systems online. And it's like the example before. I said people put code full of SQL injection holes and things like that online. And then all these people go, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, <laughs> because they've now gone and built their systems in this way. So that's very concerning. But I don't want to just beat up on developers, because it's not always just developers. It is security pros as well. And I think saying the security auditor is an idiot for asking for the plain text version of every single password in the system and an email with said plain text password every time someone changes it, the guy is an idiot. <laughs> Oh, and any private keys for SSH. So yeah, just give us all those things. Security auditor, asking questions. So we can't just blame developers, but I appreciate also that security is a complex thing. And it can be very hard for people to wrap their head around. And sometimes it's just not clear what is the difference between Wingdings and PGP. <laughs> it, is <laughs> it is a complex space. You can kind of get it because the wingdings are like little aeroplanes and things, and it doesn't, it doesn't look like it's decipherable at all. So it can be confusing. I get that. But I don't want to just focus on the builders and those of us securing systems. It's not always our fault. And the reality of it is sometimes we do just have downright problems with our users. They do do bad things. So did everyone see when Twitter got hacked? Twitter got hacked? It's on the news. Twitter must have got hacked. Because that's how Burger King became McDonald's. <laughs> they decided they didn't like the Whopper, and now they like the Big Mac, and it was all over Twitter. Tangentially, they actually picked up 30,000 followers overnight after this happened a couple of years ago. It's a little marketing ploy in there, maybe. But the headlines were Twitter was hacked. And every time someone chooses a crap password, or they reuse it, or they put it somewhere discoverable, it's Twitter who's hacked. Now, the same thing happened to TV5 Monde in France recently. You guys have seen this. So, so for those who haven't seen this, they're interviewing the reporter. And he's going, yes, we've been hacked. And, da, 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 da. and um, yeah, so over the back of his shoulder, um, <laughs> up on the board, enhance, it probably would help. But then I'd be disclosing other people's passwords in a public talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
We should do that later. <laughs> so this is the thing, and it happens, and you sort of go, okay, look, all right, it's stupid to have it up there. Uh, probably the most stupid thing was having a film crew in there filming it, uh, but it's a one-off, and it's not like that sort of thing happens very much until they do it again. <laughs> And the next day they're there and up on the keyboard we have credentials again, enhance again. <laughs> so this sort of stuff happens and it is users making bad decisions. But equally users get very confusing messages because they see things like this. They see a QR scanner and the QR scanner needs access to calendars, contacts, locations, because this is how QR scanners work, right? They go through your freaking address book and look at who you're having lunch with. <laughs> and the real problem for the user is what's the one thing the user sees on that screen? Except, like, what is the button that is stopping me from doing the thing that I want to do? What do I need to press to go on and actually be productive? And we are building these systems, we collectively as builders. So we've got a little bit of responsibility there. But I appreciate also consumers are getting a lot of really odd mixed messages about security. And consumers now have to decide between having an HDMI cable with antivirus protection or not. <laughs> now we know there is a lot of FUD about HDMI cables, but this takes it to a whole other level. And you <laughs> You've got to sort of picture the consumer as well because the, you know, the guy's in the store and he's going, well, this one's got antivirus protection, this one's got nothing, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> and it's got my you know, it's, it, it is made hard on consumers in order to be able to make the right decisions. And I had to wonder if maybe one of the things that's making it hard on consumers is they're getting very mixed messages, particularly via social media. They get messages that are counter to the message that we would really like to give them about application security. So often it's things like just wanting to use a strong password. I want to use more than 12 characters for my password. Well, you can't because security. Make sense? <laughs> That's all the consumer gets back. So social media in particular is really bad at giving crazy advice. Now, in other times, we find that consumers are genuinely trying to do the right thing. They want to use strong passwords. They want to use password managers and sometimes possibly have to paste the password into the app. But if they did that, the app could lose their security certificate. And they could be brute forced attacked. Now, I'm kind of curious as to how you'd have a brute force attack because you allow pasting. It's like you just have all these people around, everyone's just pasting at the same time. <laughs> and then at the end, the security certificate's just gone. That's how it happens, allegedly. So social media is giving some really bad advice in terms of the reasons why things are done with application security. But they're also giving bad advice in terms of practices, so how people should protect personally identifiable information. Just chuck it all in a DM. You know, I'm just some Twitter account that's just replied to you, and trust me, I do have the little blue logo thingy, which means I'm fine, just like Burger King did. <laughs> but just put it in a DM and send it to me, and then it will sit on your Twitter timeline, on your machine, in the clear, and it will sit on our Twitter timeline in the clear, and it will probably fire off an email and a DM as well. But don't worry, just do it. So advice from social media is often atrociously bad. But at least you can kind of understand this one. I got one myself a few years ago that I'm still trying to work out. It's taken me three years. If anyone knows what this means... <laughs> this is not made up. <laughs> if you work it out, please let me know. Now, as much as this is amusing, it's very sort of low-level basic stuff. It's just crappy advice via social media. And clearly what we want social media managers to do is just take the discussion offline. I hear your concern, let's maybe not DM me your password, but maybe we have a private chat about the thing to do. But at the other end of the spectrum we've got governments. And of course we have learned an awful lot about governments in recent years. We've learned things that in many ways are our worst fears. Now in many ways some of them are also amazingly cool. And the NSA's toy box did have some pretty good stuff in it. So things like Rage Master, which first of all is a totally awesome name. <laughs> it is so James Bond. But this was a wiretap and a VGA cable. They put it on the little red line on the VGA cable. They shine a radar into it remotely and then they can see what is on the screen. Which is enormously cool. It is very, very James Bond stuff. And again, awesome choosing of a name. 
But one of the other things that is really interesting that we did learn about governments was about how effective many of the security controls that we have good, free or general access to really are. Things like SSL, they were so happy when they found that SSL was missing in parts of Google's network segments that they broke down and started drawing emoticons. We've got this now classic smiley face on the network segment that has no SSL because they were so excited about it because when it's done right, SSL works really well. And this is actually really interesting for us because we know that we have very easy access to this. Now the problem, of course, is that SSL works so well that some people don't really like it very much at all. Now we'll see what comes out of this. I can't see David Cameron or the UK managing to actually ban encryption or ban SSL in any sort of feasible way. It's just simply not going to happen. It works too well, it's too effective, it's used too much across the world for one government to be able to come along and say we're going to backdoor it or compromise it. And every time they've tried to do that in the past, it really hasn't worked out very well. So frankly, the government starts to look pretty unhinged. And there's this interesting thing here where you say, well, you know, governments, they're kind of meant to be sensible, right? <laughs> they're not meant to do unhinged things. But then we start thinking about unhinged and we see stuff like this. And nobody saw this coming. You know, this was the craziest thing. And frankly, I still have trouble believing that this was DPRK and that they've just gone all guardians of peace and skulls and crossbones and defacement. I mean, they did basically everything except ask for Bitcoin, as far as I know to Sony. And the funny thing is, is that we, we get used to thinking about governments as wanting to infiltrate and be pervasive and persistent and silent and exfiltrate over a long period of time and basically be pretty subtle in what they do because that is what is most effective for gathering intelligence. It makes sense. So to just deface is just a very, very odd thing. Now the interesting thing with Sony as well is that we found that that did have some serious impacts in the physical world. So what I mean by that is that they obviously pulled the movie. They were going to show the movie in cinemas. They got pulled. They got threats against cinemas. Even Team America got pulled from some cinemas, and that's been out there for a decade or something. But now we're worried about upsetting the access of evil, and maybe they'll you know, <laughs> deface another corporate website. So it's interesting to see how AppSec does start to extend into the physical world. And sometimes we find that it's almost like AppSec's not ready for the physical world. And we see things that were probably just never in anybody's threat model. You know? Well, who are we worried about? A government, DPRK, uh, an envelope with a window in it. <laughs> you know? This is what comes undone. You know, did we ever expect to fold it up and then it's in the... So that's an odd thing. But of course, one of the things about the physical world is it's very good at circumventing digital controls. Because you can do things like this. It's still two-factor. I mean, you've still got to have the thing. Yes, it is pinned to a board with all the RSA tokens and all the pins for the RSA tokens sitting there behind a webcam, which may or may not be publicly accessible. But here we are. And it is sort of this use of physical world to circumvent digital controls. Now, of course, there is a lot of AppSec happening in the physical world. And as we connect more and more things and more and more things have microprocessors, we do get worried about some of the testing that's going on. So everyone's probably seen Chris the other day now. Who wants to take a flight with Chris? <laughs> One guy. <laughs> It'd be fun. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, sitting with the guy pen testing an Airbus at 30,000 feet, I'm just not so sure about it. No, I, I, frankly, I think Chris needs his own airplane because he's doing some really interesting stuff, but I just don't really want to be on the plane with him. It's just interesting also to see how this has played out because, okay, you know, we, we know that he's plugged into some devices, he's probably got some info. Uh, if you read the news, he made the plane fly sideways. <laughs> it's probably NASA that's more interested in that than NSA if he's actually managed to make an Airbus fly sideways. And then the whole thing's been blown up where he has admitted hijacking the plane in midair. You know, I'm not quite sure that's exactly what it was, but here we are and things get blown out of proportion. But when we do talk about connected things in AppSec, of course, the big thing that everybody's talking about these days is IoT. So IoT is the new exciting thing. And everybody is rushing to connect all their things because for some reason your fridge does need to talk to your toaster. And if you can be the first to market with the toaster fridge bridge for some reason, <laughs> you will do very, very well. So we see stuff like this. This is Lifex. This is an Aussie invention, so I want to go a little bit easy on it. However, they're pretty cool. They are light bulbs that are connected, so you can control the light bulbs from your smartphone. 
and you can change the colour and the mood and the brightness. You can go into disco mode, you know, whatever you want to do, uh, which is kind of cool. Now, LIFX did have a vulnerability last year, and the interesting thing is, is that people say, well, if my IoT thing has a vulnerability, do I really care? So do I really care if an attacker puts my light bulbs into disco mode? Maybe not. But when the attack vector was that the light globes were leaking the Wi-Fi credentials of the network they are on, now I care. Because now my light bulbs are a vector into my internal network. And this is what people have got to think about with IoT. It's not just the device itself. It's what are you connecting it to? What are you entrusting it with? Now, LIFX came out and said, look, you know, we screwed up, we had a vulnerability. However, we do not know of anyone having been owned by their light bulbs, which is good news. You should all go and patch your light bulbs. <laughs> I don't know how to patch a light bulb. <laughs> so now people have got to start to think about how to actually keep their IoT things up to date and patched and secure in ways that they never had to think about before. And it's only getting weirder because we're getting more and more weird IoT stuff. So we're getting stuff like the connected toilet. This is real, it's Japanese, as are all good toilet things. <laughs> and this is the companion app. And the companion app lets you control the toilet. If anyone speaks Japanese, I'd actually like someone to explain this to me, because I'm particularly interested in that middle one, which is like a calendar <laughs> with some kind of event-driven data or something on it, which is not immediately clear. But the thing about it is when you start connecting your toilet, you now have to be worried about attack vectors on your toilet. And there has been a security advisory related to the toilet. <laughs> and this is enormously worrying because now you can suffer a backdoor attack by your toilet. And that is about the scariest thing I can leave you with in terms of this wonderful industry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Big questions. Yeah, sure. We're happy to have him at Troy Hunt, Australia. We have time for one or two questions. Nobody wants questions. Everyone's thinking about the toilet. You're <laughs> <laughs> scared of the toilet. So, yeah, so Jim. I, I think that as an absolute, it's an impossible thing. And I think the concept that it is either going to be secure and fantastic or it's going to be crap is probably not the right question. But I think it's a degree, look, I mean, maybe the question is, can we do it better? And yeah, I mean, we can do it a lot better. You know, do we really need to log in with our mobile number? Probably not. Anyone else? Okay. Then we are running a bit late with Michael. He was perfect on time. <laughs> the best organized speaker I ever met. Thank you, Troy Hunt, and you'll be here for two days. Thanks, guys. Now go to your track and get some rockets. Turn the door.